to The Sower, a podcast of the Ciceronian Society. The Ciceronian Society is a community of Christian scholars and public intellectuals committed to to the examination of three core themes, tradition, place, and things divine, and their role in the intellectual discipleship of the church and civilization generally. To learn more about us, our events, the podcast, our journal, Pietas, to sign up for our newsletter and to make your tax-deductible gift, please go to ciceronianssociety.org. That's C-I-C-E-R-O-N-I-A-N-S-O-C-I-E-T-Y.org. I'm Josh Bowman, Vice President of the Ciceronian Society. And before introducing our guest, please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, O Lord, that you would bless our conversation and that all we say and do would bring glory and honor to you. Amen. We're recording this on August 8th on the afternoon, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend, Ryan Holston. Ryan is professor and Jonathan M. Daniels uh, Class of 61 chair at Virginia Military Institute, or VMI as it's more widely known. He is also editor at the journal Humanitas, and his work has appeared in History of Political Thought, Harvard Theological Review, and Telos, or Telos, depending on how you read that, among other places. And in addition to the book we're discussing today, he previously edited a collection of essays called The Historical Mind, Humanistic Renewal in a Post-Constitutional Age, published by SUNY Press in 2020. And currently, he's writing a book at the intersection of politics and literature, which examines the authority of science in public life. Its working title is Promethean Politics, the Cult of of science and the modern imagination. And if I'm not mistaken, you actually presented on some aspect of that book at the Ciceronian Society Conference, right? That's right. Uh, I presented a chapter from that book that I'm working on now, still working on, um, but that chapter was on the thinking of Flannery O'Connor. Awesome. I think it was called like the Flannery O'Connor and the violence of humanitarianism or something like that. Yep. Um, great, great, great stuff. Great stuff. But today we're going to talk on his other book, uh, the book that was published this year, also by SUNY Press, called Tradition and the Deliberative Turn, a Critique of Contemporary Democratic Theory. Now, Ryan's book considers the importance of Hans Georg, God- Hans Georg Gadamer's practical philosophy for reconceiving democratic deliberation in a manner that's more rooted in history and tradition. And given the Ciceronian Society's emphasis on tradition, this book immediately caught our attention, and I'm excited to tell you all more about it. Now, before we get to Gadamer, we need to set the stage here, and I'm going to talk more than I usually like to, but I think my, my goal here is to try and steer this conversation in a way that doesn't get too much into the weeds. Uh, many of our listeners will have heard of people, for example, like Rousseau, Kant, Rawls, Habermas, and maybe Gadamer, but we're going to assume that you haven't read them. So I'll start by saying this. There's a lot of talk nowadays about threats to democracy and whether democracy is dead or alive. And the mainstream media and thinkers on the left especially have labeled this or that policy institution or politician as more or less democratic, successfully creating a kind of moral intuition where many people associate small d democratic with right and non-democratic with wrong. Now, speaking for myself, it's seldom clear what they mean by this. And sometimes it's just self-evidently partisan in nature where something, where we're calling something undemocratic is the same as saying that one's party is not getting its way. Put another way, Republicans and Democrats alike love to argue that their side of an issue is synonymous with the will of the people. I hear this especially with, when, uh, with partisan commentary on the Supreme Court when that comes up, especially this last summer. Uh, the partisan argument could be a kind of one way I, I, I thought about putting this is, and I think you put this in the book too, it's, it's a kind of utilitarian calculation in which one side or the other is saying that if you aggregated all the individual interests and tried to maximize the satisfaction of those interests, you would do well to follow our party's platform. And so this can take on a majoritarian or social contract-esque justification. But there's another shape for this justification that originates in the late 18th century and which now dominates academic conversations in democratic theory. It is, namely, a way of justifying or evaluating democratic deliberation and political outcomes based on how well they advance individual self-determination and autonomy. It's a a key point here. Um, Because democratic theorists overwhelmingly equate liberty with a radical understanding of autonomy. And I think this is a really important point to bring out. Put another way, when theorists say that democracy is happening and succeeding, are they saying this because we've advanced some common good or utility agreed to by a numerical majority, or 
Are we saying this because we're observing more autonomy and self-determination in the population as a whole? And the extent to which a democracy achieves these different goals is allegedly a product of how that democracy facilitates deliberation and decision-making. And that's a long introduction that I've talked way too much. But Ryan, I just want to, you know, evaluate me setting the stage there. And, um, you know, is, is, is that a good way to, to describe kind of what you're getting at? Well, it's, it's a nice intro because what I think it does, Josh, is it sort of takes us through maybe the two uh, recent, and when I say recent, I'm going back, you know, probably to the mid 20th century, um, phases of democratic theory that we've seen in our lifetimes. Um, so in the mid 20th century, I'll back up just a little bit and kind of give you a big perspective. In the mid 20th century, that aggregative model of uh, democratic theory was predominant. And so what I mean by that is, you know, when theorists of democracy uh, were talking about what it is that um, makes democracy the most legitimate or just form of regime, uh, the answer that they tended to give in the mid 20th century uh, was that it tended to maximize the preferences of the members of society better than any other system of government. And so in that sense, what I would call the utilitarian strain of thinking, which goes back, uh, you know, all the way, really all the way back to Thomas Hobbes, um, that was essentially predominant in the West up through the mid to late 20th century. Now, you get to a period in the 1990s, and uh, this other strain of thinking, which you mentioned, the autonomy strain, or what I call in the book the autonomy tradition, that tends to sort of eclipse uh, the aggregative justification of democracy. In other words, what you see is kind of an appeal to thinking that I trace all the way back to Rousseau, which says what's really important is not so much. Uh, a kind of, you know, preference maximizing effect of democracy. Uh, what's really important is that everyone can say on some level or another that we have come to accept or endorse the, the laws that govern us as our own. In other words, it's the will of the people that is in some sense, reflected in the policies that govern us. And in that sense, it's actually thought to be less impositional. And here's what I mean by that, or here's what they mean. There's a democracy start to say in the late 20th century, in the, in the 1990s, they start to say, you know, if all I'm doing is casting a vote and then crossing my fingers that other people's votes uh, are outnumbered by the people on my side, uh, then really I haven't treated them as an equal. What I really want to do ultimately is to bring other people on board to the views that I want to see prevailing. And they're supposed to do the same. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that deliberation or persuasion or public justification takes on a new prominence. We're not just casting votes in the hopes that ours win. And just sort of saying, you know, <laughs> I, I hope I beat those other guys, right? Now we're going to engage them in a, in a deliberative process or justification. And in doing so, uh, the hope or the aspiration is that they will come to be persuaded over, you know, to my views so that we have a public consensus. And that will ultimately be uh, authorized by every member of society. And that's what I mean when I say, or they say, it's less impositional. It's essentially, uh, and this is why I trace it back to him, this is essentially a new version of Rousseau's general will. Um, and so that's why Rousseau uh, takes on a really prominent role in this book. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, you, you start to hear uh, all these references to public reason in the 1990s, in the last few decades in contemporary democratic theory, uh, is because, you know, they're trying to essentially re-articulate that theory of the general will in a new way. And it, and it gets much more sophisticated. There are lots of variations of this. 
Um, but the thinkers who become prominent, and you mentioned a couple of their names before, Jürgen Habermas, John Rawls, they ultimately trace their thinking back uh, to Rousseau and then the guy who follows him pretty closely, uh, Immanuel Kant as well. Um, now, this, this term deliberation uh, you know, comes up a lot. Now, when I think of deliberation, I'm thinking uh, I'll deliberate between which donut I want to eat uh, on a Sunday morning. Um, but that's, that's clearly not what you mean. This is a much more uh, complicated idea. Um, and I, so I'd, I'd like you to unpack a little bit what you mean by, by deliberation, because it's, it's, it, it is a, especially in, in the tradition of democratic theory, it, it has taken on a whole life of its own. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us a, se- a sense in which, wh- what do they mean by deliberation? Because it's key to their, to the democratic theorists, um, idea and also to, you know, where, how you're going to bring Gadamer in eventually. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, thanks. So uh, I think I'm going to try and, um, as you said, I'm not going to get too far into the weeds here. So I'll try and paint this with a little bit of broad brushstrokes. And if uh, people out there are familiar with the deliberative democratic literature, they'll forgive me if I'm doing so and being a little bit too concise here. But I think there are two broad strains of thinking when it comes to deliberative democracy. Um those who, uh, as I mentioned before, follow Jürgen Habermas and those who follow John Rawls. Um, and we might call those who follow Habermas proceduralists or Republican thinkers, so that's a small r, Republican, um, and maybe constitutionalists, uh, and that's those who follow John Rawls. And what they essentially do is they say public reason can be pursued in one of those two ways. Um, the proceduralists basically want to set up uh, a set of procedures that allow for the widest possible deliberation that you can imagine. And so it goes beyond just kind of the formal institutions of public policy that we that most of us have in mind um, when we look out there and we look at the institutions of government. It's going to extend very far into all sorts of areas of civil society. Uh, the constitutionalists or those who follow Rawls um, actually don't want quite as broad or as widespread a deliberation. They see a set of prevailing liberal norms that they think ought to guide public deliberation. And so either one of those is going to be a strategy for developing uh, a kind of long-term consensus. And that consensus is going to be what justifies the policies that govern us. And so, you know, again, with uh, with Habermas, that's going to be extremely, it's going to be very extensive. With Rawls, there's going to be kind of an attempt to limit ourselves um, just to uh, principles that are, um, you know, they, they tend to be, what uh, they tend to go back to his first book. So if you have any familiarity with the theory of justice, um, you know, justice is fairness is kind of uh, his articulation of what those broad uh, liberal, uh, broad prevailing liberal norms that come out of, um, you know, sort of post wars of religion, Western society. Uh, And so they're a little bit more restricted or regulated. But basically, uh, what you're looking at is either a predetermined consensus um, or one that is yet to be determined. And, you know, they uh, they basically say this is how public legitimacy can be achieved. It's not going to. Um, and this is kind of the, the key move that I make. And you mentioned Gottimer sort of lurking in the background here, ready to ready to pounce, so to speak, uh, for my critique. Um, but they they appeal to either of these ways of deliberating um, because they think that we have achieved a kind of uh, level of modernity that no longer allows for thick or metaphysical claims uh, of shared norms that are evolved out of a, a common tradition, um, like we used to find in, well, certainly in Christendom, but even up through, uh, roughly speaking, the 17th century. Depends which deliberative Democrat um, you're talking about, where they're going to 
you know, where they're going to mark that in time. But uh, once we get into modernity, um, all we can kind of hope for is an appeal to other individuals um, as free and equal subjects in Western society. And they are kind of, you know, if you think about Immanuel Kant, um, those kind of free and equal individuals uh, are all that can be assumed sort of self-directed or autonomous individuals are all that we can really, uh, all that we can really, I guess, imagine as our fellow interlocutors in the public sphere. We're not talking about old, thick conceptions of community anymore. And so, you know, religion, tradition, um, you know, these, these older, thicker conceptions of community, they're not going to be a sort of sound basis um, in Western liberal society for deliberating public policy. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where Gadamer comes in because, you know, the charge that I make in the book using his thinking is that this is kind of assuming too much. Uh, it's a little bit too utopian or idealistic to think that deliberation can get off the ground uh, without any sort of a shared conception of the good life. Now, I, I didn't think about it until you just said that last sentence, but we, to, to what extent, and let's, let's see if we can answer this in a very short thing here. To what, couldn't a Rawlsian respond and say, well, the overlapping consensus is a concept of the good life that we all might agree to. Um, you know, is... Is is it just in, in, in now? No, you know what I mean. In one, in one sense, they're not going to say that, right? Because it, liberalism is characterized by this this uh, aversion to a capital G good in a way, right? Um, and so let let's not go there. The other thing too would be that um, uh, that may, is it. Why wouldn't it just be as utopian to say that we could ever co- have a shared common? Conception, conception of the good. This is not my view, by the way, but I'm 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 just I'm trying to channel other people that might cr- cr- criticize this. You know, is is there a way? And this might get to why um, the the other thinkers that that we've mentioned so far, Rousseau, Kant, Habermas, Rawls, that they they haven't really looked to history and tradition for moral reasoning. Is it is it because I mean, do do they see it as just like uh, you and and frankly I see this kind of project of of, of going for a kind of consensus procedurally or otherwise as um, it's not going to work. Uh, but at the same time, isn't there a problem on the other side saying, do you really think we're going to have a kind of shared tradition, a shared moral reasoning, or shared concept of the good? Is that is that realistic anymore? Yeah. No, it's it's a great question and it's a great challenge and it's precisely where these post metaphysical thinkers are coming from. That's precisely their orientation. Mm-hmm. They say we are beyond community. And so that's why you mm-hmm. have this Kantian or Rousseauian individual as kind of the only it's the only game in town. It's the only way that they can conceive of deliberation taking place. Um and so uh the challenge uh, that you're bringing up is really what I deal with in chapter six of the book. That's the last chapter. I've already at that point kind of presented my alternative view of deliberation, which I do in chapter five. And then in chapter six, what I say is, okay, um, I've shown why the sort of liberal individual that they posit is uh, the only kind of interlocutor we could imagine in modernity existing, why that's um, idealistic. Uh, what if we reverse the charge? You know, what if we say, just like you did, uh, there's no such thing as community anymore. There's no such thing as a thick embedded individual anymore. Um, and the answer that I come up with is, uh, absolutely. You know, we can't, we can't romantically conceive of individuals as somehow uh, like, you know, um, medieval or ancient Greek polis, uh, you know, embedded subjects, that's not going to do. But a better way to look at this is rather than seeing the alternatives as 
abstract liberal individuals and embedded, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, medieval or ancient Greek, um, you know, tr tradition, uh, tradition imbued subjects. Why not view this as a continuum instead of as just two Manichaean alternatives? And if you do that, my sense is you really take away a lot of the firepower of their argument. In other words, I think what they're up to is creating a straw man argument, which says that if you don't embrace that abstract liberal individual, you are simply left with an old traditional romantic conception of the subject that is just past. You know, we can't, we can't go back there. And therefore, you have to embrace modernity wholesale. You have to embrace pluralism. You have to embrace radical autonomy. There's no other game in town. Now, and in so, order to... Oh, yeah, go, go, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to, just to sort of recapitulate. I mean, and so, you know, what I say is, if we're more honest, and I think Gonimer is helpful here, if we're more honest, the way to think about this is an ongoing conversation between the individual and community, and that there's no reason we can't, as whatever you want to call us, traditionalists, neo-Aristotelians, communitarians, however you want to conceptualize that, there's no reason we can't push the needle back in our direction a little bit. Um, and so we're, I think we're giving up considerably less ground, we the you know, traditionalists are giving up considerably less ground if we view this as a continuum instead of Manichaean alternatives. Now, in order to do that, then we've mentioned Gadamer a couple of times, but let's, for for the sake of our our audience, who, can you explain just in a, a relatively quickly who Hans Gehr Gadamer? I mean, relatively quickly, the guy's a pretty big <laughs> deal, um, but uh, you know, unless, he's still even among. You know the world, the worlds that we live in, right? Political theory, or even among theologians and philosophers, they, they, they many have heard of him, but they, he's not necessarily a go-to guy anymore. Um, and uh, I think actually the first time I ever heard of him was, I think I heard a presentation by you years ago. Um, <laughs> I was like, who is this guy? Uh, so t tell us who who Gadamer is. Yeah, sure. So, um, in in the interest of time, I think maybe the best way to approach this is. Um, you know, the use that Gadamer has for my project in particular. Yeah. Um, so when I look at Gadamer, um, I see him as, so first of all, he's a 20th century philosopher, a uh, German philosopher who uh, in his life spanned almost exactly the span of the 20th century. He was born in 1900, died in 2002. Uh, so he saw a lot, as you can imagine. Um, yeah. But... But um, I see one of the big problems that he is grappling with as a philosopher is our estrangement from the past, our estrangement from the tradition uh, that he thinks we're no longer capable of considering as truth or wisdom or genuine insight that is contained within that historical experience. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like we've turned a deaf ear to the past. We almost sort of, and this is kind of connects, you can see right away, it connects with this idea of liberalism and the enlightenment. Um, we see the past as kind of dead, as kind of silent to us into our lives. And I think he want, what he wants to do is he wants to restore or rehabilitate, which is a word I use quite often in the book, an idea of the past as kind of a, uh, as life's teacher. Um, you know, as Cicero would say, and I, I had, you know, I had to quote Cicero talking to the, you know, the Ciceronian Society podcast. Um, but, uh, you know, history's life's teacher, a magistra uh, vitae, right? Is, kind of, is a very, I think, a very Gadamerian way of thinking about the past, that it, its lessons need to be applied uh, to, the, to our lives here in the present. And so you might say, okay, so then how did that happen, right? How did we become so estranged, or how is it that, you know, how did enlightenment happen? How did modernity happen? How did we come to view the past 
as kind of dead to us in this way? Well, you know, a lot of a lot of philosophers take on uh, this question. Gadamer's approach is to say that it's really the scientific mindset or the scientific attitude toward that we've adopted towards the past that has made us uh, essentially objectify it. Right? We see the past or we see our historical experience as an object. Um, almost like you would, and he gives the, he gives us this metaphor for talking about both historical texts and for talking. He he also talks about art this way. He says we think about the past almost as kind of like uh, as if we were walking through a museum, and we're looking at different uh, exhibits in the museum and sort of just sort of like sort of waltzing through and saying, oh, this is interesting, that's interesting, but almost kind of putting ourselves at a distance from those exhibits, seeing them as really having no bearing on our lives. And I think that, um, you know, another way to say this, which Gadamer, I think, kind of gives us that's helpful for understanding his thinking, he wants to say that the past, a better way to engage with the past, is to see it as involved in a, con a constant conversation with us. In other words, the past, if you want to read historical text right, if you want to interpret a piece of art in a way that is more meaningful and in which genuine truth or knowledge is to emerge, you have to sort of see it as a conversation partner. And uh, one of the ways that he talks about this, you know, he, he sort of um, articulates it at one point in Truth and Method as kind of an Aristotelian meme. And what I mean by that is he says, look, you can't heavy handedly interpret uh, a historical text, let's say, or for that matter, a historical event uh, in kind of a heavy handed way where you say, you know, where you kind of distort it. And you, you, know, you sort of, you, you, have a, uh, you have an agenda, right? And this is what I'm going to make this thing say come hell or high water. Right? Uh, but you also can't do the exact opposite, which is to say that I'm going to let the past entirely do all the talking. And I'm not going to have it, I'm not going to let it have any bearing on my life whatsoever. It's just going to speak on its own terms. Instead, what he says is there's got to be a meeting ground in which truth emerges between the past and the present. And this is one of his famous ideas called the this fusion of horizons of understanding between past and present, in which I take the past as I understand it, and I apply it to my present circumstances, right? And so I, I look at a historical text or I look at a particular event within history. And I say, what is it that this means for me here and now under the circumstances in which I'm living? And I think, you know, the example that he gives, uh, the illustration that he gives for letting uh, a historical text, or for that matter, a piece of art, talk to you in this way, he says, is uh, the preacher on the one hand, or uh, the lawyer or judge on the other. And so if you think about what a preacher does, right, with a, a piece of scripture, you know, uh, there's not really an attempt to look at a piece of uh, scriptural text as simply far removed from us here in the present. You know, what did it mean for the Israelites at the time in which they were living? And we're only going to let that text speak, and we're not going to consider what it means here and now. No. What a, what a good preacher does is a preacher will say, what is it that this text means for our lives? What is it saying to us here and now in light of present circumstances? And for that matter, the good lawyer or judge, when they're looking at a, you know, a particular uh, piece of case law, right, or, or a, a code, right, a, a, a statute, they're going to say, how does it apply to the clients or to the parties before us in this courtroom? Right. Um, what does it mean for their lives? How would it best apply to their circumstances? And I think that's where Gadamer says genuine truth in understanding emerges. 
And that's how we can really learn from the past. The past is not something that we're to approach like a scientist would, right? That's the, you know, and I think that scientific approach is the approach to the past, which says it's just this dead object, like a, an artifact in a museum. It's just sort of silent and, or excuse me, we're silent and it's just sort of sitting there doing all the talking. There has to be a conversation between past and present in which we're saying, you know, what is the relevance of this voice for my life here and now or for our lives here and now? And, and in your reading, you're, you're saying that the, these, the, the theorists of deliberative, deliberative democracy are, are kind of, they're eschewing that conversation between past yeah. and present. Yeah. So I think what they essentially want to say is, uh, <laughs> well, I think this gets to, uh, let, me, let me back up for, for just a second, because uh, I think that that sort of jumps the gun a little bit, right? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're fine. Hey, go ahead. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, what, what are the implications uh, of looking at ourselves and our past in this way? Well, we're never really entirely divorced, right, from, uh, you know, the history or, uh, you know, all of the, you know, the sociological uh, events which comprise you and me here and now, right? We can't be the kind of public reasoners that, uh, you know, the sort of modern liberal theory wants us to be because we are always embedded in a concrete situation, you know? Uh, what Gadamer's essentially saying is that the concrete traditions in which we are always embedded they're what makes any interpretive any interpretation possible. It's the constitutive lens through which we understand the world, and for that matter, we understand each other. Well, okay, so if that's what your conception of a reasoner looks like, if you're always embedded in a concrete tradition, if you're always constituted by the circumstances uh, that you've inherited and which surround you then that's going to have an important role to play in how you talk to others, right? That's going to have a very meaningful role to play in how you articulate yourself in the public forum and the normative appeals that you make with your fellow citizens. Um, but if that's the case, look, you know, tradition's not so problematic as they seem to think, right? In other words, that appeal to the post-metaphysical subject, right? That sees tradition as this kind of problematic, you know, uh, you know, this thing that we have to get past in all of our appeals. We're all liberal subjects. We can sort of look beyond that and we can appeal to one another only as autonomous individuals. But what this says is those very thick or encumbered subjects, right? Those tradition-imbued subjects who do all the talking in the public forum, right? They understand each other not in spite of all that metaphysical baggage, but because of all of that metaphysical baggage, that so-called baggage, right? In other words, our traditions help us understand. Our traditions are useful for understanding where each other are coming from. And in fact, people who uh, are from the same tradition are capable of understanding one another better than people who are from different traditions. Now, Gadamer doesn't say that people from different traditions can never understand one another. But he does seem to be saying that people from the same tradition are capable of using their prejudices. Their prejudices are actually the useful common ground from which they can have conversations. And so that's how I use his thinking, right? Prejudice is something that he thinks needs, actually needs to be uh, rehabilitated in our minds. Um, and one of, the, one of the famous or pithy phrases that comes out of truth and method, and sort of, I think, poking fun of modernity when he says this, is he says there's a prejudice against prejudice. That's a very <laughs> modern way of looking at prejudice, which he says uh, isn't entirely accurate, or it's not an accurate way of thinking about the subject. The, the, you know, the individual uh, on the liberal or enlightenment view 
it's kind of stripped down and, and kind of uh, it's kind of a naked view of what real understanding looks like. We understand not in spite of, but because of the prejudices and the traditions that we are acculturated into. Um, you know, you you had um, you know talked. We, we were emailing a little bit before um, before the podcast, and and um, you know one of one of the things that. I was emailing you about at one point was, uh, you know, what's sort of a concise way to articulate this criticism of the deliberative Democrats from a Gaudamarian point of view. I think one way to say it is you might say that he or I am accusing them of being kind of sociologically naive, that there are certain things that traditions do for us in public deliberations that they don't want to admit, that its fruits are kind of taken for granted. Um, by this sort of autonomy tradition. And so a Gaudamarian perspective is kind of a helpful, I think, wake-up call for remembering what the fruits of tradition are that help us to engage in public deliberation. Now, with with all that in mind, and I apologize that one of my neighbors is using some kind of large power tool at the moment. Um, if you can hear that, <laughs> that, that that's okay. My my dog is barking in the background. All right, well so that's can... that's 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 the sound of America right there. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now I I want to bring up this this other you know uh, response we could get to here, and this you know the, the talk of tradition and prejudice brings up the. Um, the uh, tradition, of course, of Edmund Burke. I mean, it sounds very Burkean when we talk about the the prejudice against prejudice. Um, and one of the things that both Gadamer and Burke have been accused of is being an historicist or a relativist. So if you're uh, kind of a, you know, if if your Gadamer flavored alternative and critique is preferred, is this just, I mean, are, are you basically replacing the obsession with autonomy or utilitarian aggregation of interests? Are you replacing it with a kind of cultural relativism or historical relativism or situational ethics in a, in a way. Don't, and don't respond to all those different categories, but is that, is that what's, what's going on here? And how do you respond to that criticism? Yeah. How dare you, Josh? <laughs> um, you know, this, this is a criticism that, um, uh, you know, be, you know, being presenting a, a, a kind of a traditionalist perspective using Gadamer's thought uh, I've encountered quite a bit um, because I think the accusation would be that I'm taking tradition too far or too seriously. Um, and at the end of the day, all you're wet, left with is an embedded subject. Um, and so it's a great challenge. Um, here's how I look at it. You'll notice one of the words uh, that has already come up in our conversation quite a bit in association with Gadamer's thinking is truth and where truth emerges. And I think Gadamer is actually a theorist or a philosopher who takes truth very, very seriously. Um, and so there's kind of a misconception out there that he is uh, a relativist. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I could take all day going into the reasons why I think this exists. I mean, there, there are various people who have kind of perpetuated this misconception. Um, one of the most famous would be Richard Gorty. Um, but he also gets into uh, kind of an argument about relativism with Leo Strauss. And I've written an article about that, a modern age article about that. But the, the upshot of kind of my defense of Gadamer is that uh, it's they, you know, you know that, that um, Rorty, Strauss, and I also think Habermas are the ones who have the misconception of truth. And I think they're more responsible for that distortion than Gadamer is. And here's why I say that. What Gadamer, the way that Gadamer characterizes their, what I would call their enlightenment idea of truth, is a kind of God's eye view of what truth looks like. In other words, they conceptualize truth as kind of a God's perspective of reality or a God's eye perspective of reality where everything is known perfectly and in a kind of static way, a kind of static photograph or picture of what reality looks like. And what Gadamer says is that's not really what truth looks like, and you don't have to be a relativist to see it this way. Um, truth is something that emerges in the course of conversation 
And in that sense, you know, I think he kind of echoes something that Russell Kirk actually says, which is that we conceive of truth through the glass darkly, right? We don't have a perfect or God's eye conception of truth. True knowing is really on this sort of Gaudamerian uh, take. It's really more a matter of uh, character or the acquisition of ethical know-how. And so what I mean by that is you kind of have to have your understanding of reality in a, a kind of, it's kind of like Plato's conception of the well-ordered soul. You, ha you have to, in order to really understand reality correctly, you have to have your soul ordered rightly. You have to have your will in its proper place, and you have to have uh, your passions in their proper place. And if all that is the case, if your soul is oriented properly towards reality, then knowing what is true is something that can come out in this sort of more fluid, conversational way than in more of a static or a kind of uh, God's eye view of reality way, if that makes sense. And so, you know, the way that, you know, it's a, it's a much more, I would argue it's a much more kind of Aristotelian or virtue ethics understanding of what it means to have knowledge of reality. We don't know the thing in itself as kind of like a static picture. Instead, we're immersed in reality so that when we know what's true and what's right and what's good, we would describe not a thing out there that is known, but we would describe the character of the subject as being an experienced human being, right? This is uh, what Aristotle would call uh, the phrenimos, right? The practically wise person. We can never really say as kind of like a, a blueprint, right? Or with a complete, comprehensive, you know, absolute knowledge of reality, what is true. But we can say what it looks like to the experienced or wise person. They're always going to be involved in a kind of practical judgment of what is right in the circumstances. Now, to a you know, a Straussian, I can understand why you know they would see that as kind of relativistic because you know context matters uh, to a very large degree. But again, drawing on Gadamer, I would say theirs is much more of an Enlightenment view of reality than even the ancients had in mind. So I you know I don't know if that's going to be satisfying to everyone, but I think it is a deeply tradition-based conception of what truth looks like. And, um, you know, if, uh, well, all I can say is if, if you're not buying the argument that I'm giving you here now, consult the article that I wrote in Modern Age about his confrontation with Leo Strauss. I think that's probably the best defense that I can give. All right. Well, I, I want to finish with one last question. Um, relate, we, we really hit on uh, tradition and things divine as our two of our three themes, but I want to finish with our theme a place, um, and I, you know, re reading through this, uh, and I, you you do explicitly talk um, in eventually in chapter five about a more localist vision for politics um, that's kind of related to Gadamer's idea of friendship, which he also gets from Aristotle. And I'd I'd like us just to finish there. I mean, there is a that the the alternative way you think that you offer about thinking about democratic deliberation. It seems not only to be rooted more in tradition, but also in a Gadamerian sense, but also in a way more rooted in place. So, do you think that's an accurate thing to say? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that you know that <laughs> again, going back to uh, this, kind of goes back to you know, some of the email back and forth that we had prior to the podcast. Yeah, the thing about the thing about place and community. Is and I think that's it's a very important concept um, to the kind of the position that I've tried to articulate in the book. Um, you know, place and tradition are kind of mutually informative concepts. They, they they sort of inform one another in a way that I wouldn't want to understand one without understanding the other. If that makes sense, I think that 
uh, tradition understood without the idea of place gives us some of this loose talk that you hear a lot of today when people just sort of loosely refer to this tradition or that tradition, you know, the American tradition or a tradition of thought, but it's not really connected to anything concrete, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we talk about, uh, you know, the way that I put it is concrete communities that exist over time, I I try and give tradition that more sort of place-oriented articulation because I don't want it to be confused with something as broad and amorphous as the American tradition or anything like that. Um, and so I think that tradition always needs to be understood in light of place. Um, but at the same time, I think that place also is best understood as traditional or as existing over time. In other words, community or a, a kind of concrete place here on earth, it doesn't emerge out of nowhere. It has roots. It has to exist over time. And if we talk about place just as if it's kind of like a, a geographical reference, right? What it means to be from, uh, you know, Southern Virginia or what have you, right? It's not really going to mean a whole lot unless you're talking about something that's intergenerational. And so I talk, especially towards the end of the book, uh, chapter six in particular, I'm thinking of, um, in those terms, I explicitly talk about the intergenerational terms of tradition and how what I mean by tradition is something that exists over time and in the form of community. And so what I really am trying to articulate there is kind of that I think, mutual relationship that you're getting at in your question between tradition and place. The two uh, are vital to being understood rightly speaking, uh, or at least as I see it. And that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at in the book. And I, and I think just sort of getting back to the question of deliberation, right? Um, what is the meaning for deliberation of place? Um, I think we have to recognize that this deliberative democratic conception, which is prevailing out there now in a lot of contemporary political thought, um, it really forgets about place. It really tries to imagine deliberation as if it, you know, in a very utopian way, as if it could be taking place among 300 million people. Um, and if you think that we really are embodied subjects, if you think that we really are concrete creatures who have pasts and um, prior generations that inform the way that we think about things and our morals, um, then I think that that will start to look kind of funny to you. I think that will look kind of silly to you um, because there is no, and they can, there can be no such thing as a conversation on that large of a scale. Uh, the genuine deliberation, what I call, you know, uh, genuine or legitimate uh, deliberation in the book, it's got to be a more local phenomenon. It's got to take place on a much more uh, small scale, local level. Um, where it's just going to be something that's kind of, uh, that's kind of impractical, but, uh, yeah, good, good question. Good, good one to end, end on. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Um, you know, the, we haven't, we have not done justice to Ryan's book and to well, everything that is going on in there. And so I want to encourage everyone to take a look once again, it's, uh, called tradition and it is published by SUNY press this year. I'll provide a link to it in the show notes and Please take a look and also take a look at Gadamer's Truth and Method. It's a classic of uh, theology, really quite uh, philosophy. It's a classic also, depending on who you're talking to, in theology and political philosophy, etc. cetera. Uh, it is a brilliant, brilliant book that will uh, outlive Ryan and I, <laughs> for sure. Um, now, uh, I just want to thank you all for listening. You've been listening to The Sower, a production of the Ciceronian Society. And if you've enjoyed this conversation and would like to meet more people like Ryan, uh, we hope you'll consider joining us for our 2024 conference in Plano, Texas, February 29th through March 2nd. Uh, panel and paper proposals were due on September 1st. My guess is this is going out after that. Uh, but more information can be found on our website. You can register and take a look there. And this topic... Uh, of truth and method, tradition, place. These are great topics to, to propose for future conferences as well as also for papers uh, to send to Pietas. Be sure to rate and review this podcast, share it with your friends, check out our website at ciceronianssociety.org, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Thank you for listening.